All right, Isaiah 55, please. Isaiah 55. We find our quarter coming to a close. This has been a survey of Isaiah. We've really hardly scratched the surface. Um, taking on the book for one quarter was a little ambitious, and we knew that going into it. Tried to just identify some themes and expose us to not only some key ideas to the book, but to dig in when possible and really show the beauty of the book. And I'm prayerful that we've been able to do that. I want to skip around just a little bit this evening. Um, our purposes are not to try and get to the end necessarily. In fact, there is some redundancy. That's not to say that it's, it's not intentional or even great to read. It is. There's, there's a lot of build in Isaiah and chapters sort of go together as a unit. Um, and so uh, what I'm hoping to do is to sample a little bit of that. Um, Isaiah's audience, right? Southern kingdom in Judah during the period of the divided kingdom. Um, just prior to the captivity that would come, Assyria is going to come first for the north. Isaiah talks a little bit about that. And then Babylon's going to come for the south in Judah. And of course, Isaiah is specifically in the city of Jerusalem. And so Isaiah will bend the ear of some of the kings from the south, that sort of stuff. Um, by and large, are they receptive to his message or not receptive to his message? Okay. All right, we had turkey this week. I understand. I'm feeling a little sluggish myself. What do you think? Did they listen to him or no? Not really, right? He's kind of like Jeremiah and some others. I mean, they, you know, it, they didn't listen to him. And one could argue, and I think we talked about this at the beginning, why, why even go through the trouble? It's important that God's word is on the record, right? That the people know, hey, listen, this, this is the will of God. And it can't be, you know, they can't say, well, God never told us. We didn't know. It's not out of ignorance that they've disobeyed the Lord. You know, they just chose otherwise. Isaiah sort of is the stick in the mud to their plans. Isaiah doesn't align with the political allegiances of um, the thoughts of the king, so on. So um, that's a lot of the issues we have going on here. So when we get to Isaiah 55, I just wanted to point out verses 8 and following. And I, we'll lift this out a little bit. We don't have time, unfortunately, to look at all the context here. But uh, I just wanted to note what the Lord through Isaiah says beginning at verse 8. Isaiah 55, 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Let's just pause there a minute. Remember in that section, uh, oh boy, what is it? Chapters 12 through 30-something. There's all these woes on all the nations. And uh, it amongst that, there's this section where Isaiah, God through Isaiah, comes at the kings of Judah, and he tells them, listen, quit relying on Egypt. Quit relying on political alliances with Syria to try and counter us, Syria. Instead, just trust in me. I'm going to take care of you. If you'll just obey me, I will see to it that you're taken care of. And God demonstrated that in a huge way in Isaiah 36, 37, 38, with the big victory over Sennacherib and the 185,000 who were killed overnight. Plug that in to this verse in verse 8. You know, we, we think that we've got all the answers and that our solutions are best. And at the very least, if you're like me and there's a problem, you at least have to have some kind of strategy in mind, right? What am I going to do? And I guess there's a balance here because we can't just say, well, it's all up to God and I'll just sit back and do nothing. But on the other side of that, we have to realize what verse 8, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Your ways are not my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Don't doubt God's power and God's love. Look what he keeps saying in verse 10. As the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and they don't return there, but they water the earth and they make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower, bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. Okay, look at the analogy he's made and then the application. God provides for physical needs and the rain and the snow provide the moisture that we need, the precipitation, 
to yield forth fruit and crops and all of that from the ground. And he says, in the same way, verse 11, my word is like that, that comes forth from my mouth. It won't return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Now, compare and contrast that with the fact that the majority of Isaiah's audience will refuse to listen. How do you merge those concepts together? God says, my word will not return void. But the king says, at least some of them said, yeah, but we'd rather go with our plan than yours, God. Or Isaiah, get out of here. What do you, you don't know what you're talking about. What do you think? And then let's make the application today, right? So we're told to go into all the world and preach the gospel, right, to everybody. Vast majority, will they hear us or not hear us? Well, no, they're probably not going to listen to us, right? What do you think? Is Isaiah 55, 11 true? We're still commanded to do it. We've got to give them a chance to respond, right? It must be true because in the Bible, right, Keith? <laughs> Okay. Yeah. John 12. The word is still going to do what it's supposed to do. It's going to judge you. Ah. So the purpose of the word goes beyond someone's receptivity to the word. Right? God's will, God's will is that all people be saved. But God's will is going to be accomplished whether others or even we ourselves accept it or reject it, right? It's going to be that way. For the grace of God, here's what Titus 2.11 says, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. That tells me that the message of the gospel, which carries the plan by which I can be saved, okay, the grace of God that brings salvation, it's, it's by God's grace that I have his will made known to me. And God's plan is going to be done whether I've, Believe it or not. There's a saying, I don't know if you've ever heard it. I heard it a lot in Tennessee growing up. Uh, God says it, I believe it, that settles it. You ever heard that? Well, here's the truth. God says it, and that settles it, whether I believe it or not. Right? I don't have to believe it for it to be true. God said it, that's it. That's the way it was in Isaiah's time. That's the way it is today. So sometimes our measure of success is skewed, isn't it? We think that success means I taught them and they were baptized. But success for a sower is just sowing the seed, right? I'm trying to hit the good ground, right? But <laughs> I'm going to sow it because I don't know what kind of ground I'm working with in somebody else's heart. Probably got a general idea, but that's not going to prevent me from sowing the seed, right? What other thoughts we have? Say again. Uh, bringing it a little closer. Okay. To me, it's also in our hearts. I don't think we all the time, well, I don't think myself has the patience for the word all the time. Mm. Uh, when I, Why do you got to step on my toes like that, Harry? I, I said me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when we have an issue, you know, we know what the word says. We study it. We listen to it. We've listened to it before and applied it in our lives before. Mm hmm. But just this situation, I don't have patience to wait on the effect of God's word. Mm. I want to listen to myself. I want to come to myself because I'm going to give myself an answer right away. God wants me to work for it. And I don't want to work for it. I want my answer right now. Yeah. And so we need to also work for our patience and knowledge and, and understanding. Doesn't it make you appreciate Isaiah more for sticking with it? You know? Uh, for keeping on going. And, and folks like Jeremiah, too. Um, you know, Jeremiah tried to quit at least once in chapter 20. And he said, I couldn't. You know, the, the, it was like a fire in my bones. And I couldn't hold it in anymore. Um, we do get discouraged sometimes. Uh, but God's word is still God's word. It's, his will is going to be accomplished. 
Go with me to chapter 59. All right, we're just going to, we're doing some samplings here. We're, we're trying to close things out a little. Chapter 59. So when you start in, uh, uh, really back in chapter 56, he's going to talk about rebellious leaders of the day. Those are things we've kind of already seen. Idolatrous practices of the time. Uh, uh, some people, you know, a promise of destruction for those who continue in rebellion, chapter 57. We come into chapter 58, and, and we've, we've got this same idea. Here are religious people, but their heart's not in it. And Isaiah began there back in chapter 1. He said, what are these sacrifices? I don't want your sacrifices. I want your heart. Well, God, you told us to do this. Well, yeah, God always desires for us to worship him in truth. And they were maybe outwardly doing something of that, but their hearts were far away. And that's Isaiah 1 is where he says, let's reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they'll be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be as wool. We come to 58, and uh, we see those themes sort of resurrected. Here are people who are religious people. They fast, but they kind of do it, and they use it as a means to like demonstrate they're better than other people. Um, they're, they're not doing it for a spiritual purpose. And so when we come to 59, Isaiah is just going to hit it right at the heart of it all. Behold, verse 1, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. All right, so God is not powerless here. Nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. Okay, so God is not insensitive toward what's happening. But your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you. Uh, there's disfavor. That's what's going on here. Um, so God refuses to respond. He will not hear. Verse 3. Look at how... All right, that wasn't just in my mind, was it? Here we go. We're going to bring the place down tonight with this content. We're getting serious. <clears throat> Look at how uh, they're just eat up with this. Uh, watch the imagery of the body. For your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken lies, your tongue has muttered perversity, widespread corruption of their deeds, hands and fingers, and their um, words, lips and tongue. And then verse 4, no one calls for justice. The ESV says, no one enters suit justly, nor does any plead for truth. Again, the ESV, no one goes to law honestly. They trust in empty words and speak lies. They conceive evil and bring forth iniquity. Well, fortunately, we don't have that problem today, so we can, <laughs> we can keep reading. We don't have to worry about that, right? Look at the poetic way that Isaiah describes what is happening. Verse 5, they hatch vipers' eggs and weave the spider's web. He who eats of their eggs dies, and from that which is crushed, a viper breaks out. So here are people who have done things in the name of service to God, if I take this as a unit in 57 and 58, they're religious leaders, but they're corrupt. They fast, but not for the right reasons. Uh, in verses 13 and 14 of chapter 58, they've turned away from the Sabbath. They're ignoring it. And so Isaiah hits them square between the eyes in 59 and says, it's your sins. That's the reason why God has separated himself from you. Actually, you're the ones who have separated yourself from God, right? Your sins have done that. And it's your deeds, your hands and your fingers, your words, your lips and your tongue. And as a result of that, it's not just hurting you, but you're acting in selfish ways. And when other people partake of or are a part of what you're doing, he who eats of their eggs dies. And then a viper comes out out of that and continues to wreak havoc, verse 5 says. And so, uh, you know, this is the problem. Verse 9, justice is far from us, they say to themselves. They're talking about uh, divine justice here, heavenly intervention. God's not, he's not really concerned about what we're doing, or if he is, we've got a long time before we have to get right with God again. 
Uh, righteousness does not overtake us. We look for light, but there's darkness for brightness, but we walk in blackness. You see, now they're saying, oh, well, even when we reach out for God, we're groping because God has, uh, we're groping in the dark because God has separated himself from us. Now they're playing the victim uh, because of a situation they've gotten themselves in. But finally, they begin to confess their sin. Verse 12. Our transgressions are multiplied before you. Our sins testify against us. Our transgressions are with us. And as for our iniquities, we know them. The idea is we're constantly haunted by the sins that we've committed. Verse 14. Justice is turned back. Righteousness stands afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. So truth fails, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. It's almost like we, it's like they're saying we live now in a cutthroat society. And if you're trying to do right by departing from evil, other people are going to come in and uh, attack you for that. See the parallels to modern society, right? We depart from God. We play a victim with that for a while. Eventually, we pray that there'll be a reckoning where people realize what's happening. They'll turn around, the realization. Thoughts or comments here? I want to build this up before we get to 61. Yeah, Keith. Which says, our sins testify against us for our transgressions are with us. Mm-hmm. Know them. People plead ignorance, I don't know. <laughs> but they really know what they're doing wrong. Yeah. Things that are against the will of God, they know, but they plead ignorance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We often know better, don't we, than what we do. Sometimes we dig our heels in and persist in what we're doing. All right, let's go to chapter 61. With that background in mind, what's interesting is Isaiah will end largely on a positive, hope-filled note. We've seen huge uh, spotlights of hope throughout Isaiah, particularly in the servant songs, haven't we? Last week with Isaiah 53, he bore our sins and and our iniquities and all of that. We come to 60, 61, and 62, and many scholars take these three chapters as a unit. They're the most optimistic chapters in the whole book. They only offer words of hope. There's no words of rebuke in these three chapters. And they describe the hope that is to come. So what I thought we could do is spend a little time here in uh, specifically 61 and look at the hope that's here. And we'll see a lot of allusions to New Testament passages as we go. Isaiah 61 verse 1. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. To preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to the captives. The opening of the prison to those who are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn. To console those who mourn in Zion. To give them beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That they may be called trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord. That he may be glorified. And they shall rebuild the old ruins. They shall raise up the former desolations. They shall repair the ruined cities. The desolations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. The sons of the foreigner shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. You shall be named the priests of the Lord. They shall call you the servants of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, you shall have double honor. Instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land they shall possess double. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. 
For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery for burnt offering. I will direct their work in truth and will make with them an everlasting covenant. Their descendants shall be known among the Gentiles, their offspring among the people. All who see them shall acknowledge them that they are the prosperity whom the Lord has blessed. Let's stop there a minute. Now remember that Isaiah is writing primarily, well, specifically to a Jewish audience. And so the references to the Gentiles, these, these Gentile nations they know are going to be coming in to overtake them in captivity, right? Isaiah has talked about that specifically with, with detail in the previous chapters. But there's hope on the horizon even after all of this takes place. Remember Isaiah writes before it happens. And then so Isaiah through thy prophecy tells them that this captivity is coming. And then he even goes beyond that to say, but there's even hope after that. Restoration, rebuilding, renewal, even riches all along the way. Do you see how I alliterated that just right off the top of my head? Tell me you're a preacher without telling me you're a preacher. Alliteration. Okay. Uh, Isaiah 61.1. Go back there a minute. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. If I'm reading Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, I'll read this quoted in that text, quoting Isaiah 61, verse 1, reference to Jesus himself. There must have been some immediate application in terms of Isaiah's day. As a New Testament Christian, I'm most interested, just personally, in how this applies to Jesus. And so Jesus says, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Was the Holy Spirit on Jesus when he came? How do you know? Okay. He's one of the Godhead. So we know Jesus is acting in unison with the other persons of the Godhead. How else? All right. At Jesus' baptism in Matthew 3. or uh, Yeah, Matthew 3. We have uh, a dove that alights on Jesus. And then the voice from heaven, the God, the Father. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Yeah. The Lord has anointed me. You know, the word anointed is actually the meaning of the Greek term Christos, from which we derive Christ. It means he is the anointed one. It indicates his three offices. He is prophet, Jesus. He is priest. He is the king. Jesus tells us the way of God, prophet. Jesus officiates and even provides through himself the sacrifice on our behalf. He's our priest. And he has all authority in heaven and on earth. He's the king. And so it makes sense that Jesus would say, the Lord has anointed me. When we think about the contrast of the sin that this, that this people had committed, even that Isaiah is talking about, the lack of justice, the, the, um, the, the religious liberalism that exists in that time. And then we look and see the justice that comes and um, uh, the reckoning on the part of those who are in sin and the freedom of those who have been oppressed. Look at what the gospel does for these people. The Lord has anointed me, verse 1, to preach good tidings. That's the meaning of the word gospel, right? Good news. Good tidings to the poor. The King James Version said to the meek. New American Standard says to the afflicted. Remember Jesus says blessed are the poor in heart. Right? And so those who would receive the good tidings, the gospel, are often those who are materially poor, sure. But the reason is not because of their material possessions, but because of their humility of heart. And that's ultimately what Jesus is getting at, right? To preach it to the poor. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Because it says the Spirit of the Lord is upon us when we receive the Holy Spirit mm. at baptism. Mm -hmm. And that because of that, He has anointed us to preach the gospel. So we are anointed to go out and do those things. Go out and do, yeah. So we tend to appropriate just the price, but it also can be applied to us. All yeah. the things that he no, I agree. Especially as we go out in His name, right? Continue to do what the work that He told us to do. I could see that. 
Uh, so those with humble attitudes, the poor, those who are willing to submit to God's will. Uh, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to bind up the brokenhearted, those whose souls have been wounded by sin's effects. To proclaim liberty to the captives, those who are in the bondage of sin. Finish the, the uh, verse. You shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Free from what? Well, the bondage of sin, right? Free from sin. And so he will proclaim liberty to those who are captives. The opening of the prison to those who are bound. I'm told that uh, in the Hebrew, it's just the word opening, that of the prison has been supplied. So we have this opening, this release of chains, the opening of the cell door, so to speak. And then to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Um, this is likely derived from the concept of the Levitical Jubilee year, Leviticus 25 verse 10 when slaves were liberated, when debts were remitted, when people were restored to their property, given the specific circumstances. And then it's, that idea is borrowed in this text figuratively to communicate the idea of an entire era of the Christian age, this time of redemption, this time of freedom that is to come, uh, that would be ahead. And also a judgment day, ultimately, the day of vengeance, of our God, the final judgment that is ultimately to come. And so Isaiah's talking about the, the period of the gospel age, as he so often has done. That's another reason why we call it the miniature Bible. We have the whole Bible, at least somewhat alluded to, within these 66 chapters of the book of Isaiah. So we've got a healing of the brokenhearted, liberty for those who were captives, uh, release from those who were bound, comfort to those who mourn, even consolation to those who mourn. And they're exchanging, verse 3, the ashes that they had, the idea they sprinkled their head with ashes in times of sadness, that's exchanged for beauty. Uh, mourning has been replaced with joy. There's no more grief over their sins. Uh, the spirit of heaviness or a faint spirit, the ESV, is now substituted with a garment of praise. And there's stability, there's fruitfulness, there will be trees of righteousness that the Lord had planted. And all of this is for the glory of the Lord. Don't miss it. You know, I read this and Isaiah is saying, this is what it's going to be like. This is, this is what it's going to be. And then I realize, this is our present, Right? Some of this is yet future, the final judgment, ultimate salvation in heaven. But this is what we're supposed to be and enjoy. Release, uh, joy, liberty, healing, beauty, praise, fruitfulness, stability. And don't miss what all this is about, the end of verse 3, that he may be glorified. You know, the Bible says in the New Testament that you may show forth the praises of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is the essence of the gospel right here. Thoughts or comments here? All right, look at verse 8. I, the Lord, love justice. This assures the fulfillment of his promise to those who are obedient. I will deal with justly how do we merge God's justice with God's grace and mercy do we want God to deal justly with us <laughs> under some circumstances no what do you think how do we put these we know that God is just and we know also that God is merciful and gracious. I like uh, how David put it in the, uh, Psalm 37 when he says, he, uh, God loves judgment and will yeah. not forsake his saints. Mm. So I would like for God to judge me under the umbrella of Jesus. Ah. Uh, that way uh, yep. I'm covered. That's right. So if God is just, 
I don't want God's justice apart from Jesus. But the cross is where the justice of God and the mercy and grace of God meet. And when I'm covered by his blood, then I'm not afraid of his justice. Because I know. I know I'm, I'm okay. And what his justice then means for me by virtue of the blood of Christ is that God makes good on his promises. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. All right, well, I'm banking on that. <laughs> I believe and I've been baptized and I continue to be crucified with Christ. Galatians 2.20. Christ lives in me. That's my prayer. And so I'm banking on shall be saved is at the end of this equation, right? And it's, not, it's more than just a formula, right? It's a relationship. It's love. But at the same time, we want God to make good on his promises. You know, God had promised throughout Isaiah, if you'll trust me, if you'll just do what I say, I'll be merciful to you. I'll be gracious to you. I'll bless you. And we're in the same position, right? God says the same thing to us. A little later, he talks about, or actually it was a little bit earlier, this, this covenant that God is going to give. Um, that's verse 8, just after this. I will direct their work in truth. I will make with them an everlasting covenant. You know, that's the covenant that we're a part of. A covenant relationship with God. A covenant that has been sealed by the blood of Jesus. We've entered into that covenant by presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice. By sacrificing, dying to the old man of sin so that we can rise to walk in newness of life. Romans chapter 6. And so we're in this covenant, and here the Bible says that it's, it's not just a covenant, it's an everlasting covenant. It's not temporal. Um, this relationship that I've begun with Jesus today will last an untold number of days, right? I mean, forever. I can't think too much about that because my mind is blown, but forever, right? You and I will never stop existing open our eyes, so to speak, on the other side of death. Resurrection morning comes, our bodies are changed, and thus we shall ever be with the Lord. And what else can you say about that, right? That's it. Infinity going forward. And so the covenant into which we've entered with God today is the covenant that is going to ride us all the way through eternity. It's an everlasting covenant. And to those who are obedient, God, who loves justice and will direct us in truth, Thanks to Jesus and the covering of Jesus' blood, we receive God's grace and mercy and therefore are confident in God's abundant blessings from now going forward. Isn't that a beautiful thought? No wonder that John can write in 1 John, I'm writing these things so you know that you have eternal life. Right? I want you to know that you have these blessings. God doesn't intend for us to go around wondering, am I in the light or not? You know, am I saved or not? He wants us to know, to have that kind of confidence. And if I don't have that kind of confidence, that's a symptom that there's some spiritual problem in my life. At the very least, some kind of weakness in my knowledge that I need to bolster up a little bit to give me the confidence that I need. Right? Thoughts or comments here? Okay. Look at... <clears throat> I thought y'all were going to be a little more talkative tonight. I'm just joking. Let's go down to uh, Isaiah 66. In 66, we have a delineation between true worship and false worship in the first four verses. And then this promise that God is going to make good on his promises, starting in verses 5 and following. Um, this allusion to the birth of a new nation, so to speak, of a spiritual Israel. Um, start at verse 5. Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word. All right, he's addressing the faithful. 
Your brethren who hated you, who cast you out for my name's sake, said, Let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy, but they shall be ashamed. Notice they were being sarcastic when they said that. Verse 6, God, that's why God says they're going to be ashamed. Verse 6, the sound of noise, ESV, of an uproar from the city, a voice from the temple, the voice of the Lord who fully repays his enemies. All right, so we have the sarcastic cry of these people, you know, oh, yeah, let, let's see God be glorified in you guys. And then this thundering voice that emerges from the temple, the voice of God. And Isaiah describes it. This is God's voice, and he fully repays his enemies. He renders recompense on those who stand against him. How's he going to do it? Verse 7. Before she was in labor, she gave birth. All right, here's something that was sudden because the Lord hastened it. Before her pain came, she delivered a male child. There are some who see this child as a reference to Jesus. Uh, to me, it makes the most sense to interpret it as the birth of a new nation, of spiritual Israel. That's the church, right? New Testament, it's the church. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? This is unique, verse 8. Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? So here's the, now this is talking about the rapid growth of Christianity. You, I mean, by some standards, statistically speaking, it, it must have been relatively small. But when you think about something beginning with 3,000 people, day of Pentecost, uh, that's a mighty movement, right? Maybe humble beginnings, statistically speaking, but 3,000 people is great. And then we, we looked at it not long ago uh, in a class recently. The book of Acts is talking about that multiplied and the word spread and the disciples grew. And you go from 3,000 to 5,000. That's just men. And then you go from there. Uh, here's this rapid growth of this movement of Christianity. As soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. Verse 9, shall I bring to the time of birth and not cause delivery, says the Lord? Shall I who cause delivery shut up the womb, says your God? In other words, God's going to fulfill his purpose. Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad with her, all you who love her. Rejoice for joy with her, all you who mourn for her that you may feed and be satisfied with the consolation of her bosom, that you may drink deeply and be delighted with the abundance of her glory. In other words, the spiritual bounty of this new system that is to come. For thus says the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river. The glory of the nations, the Gentiles, the New King James says, ESV says, the nations... Like a flowing stream, then you shall feed. On her sides shall you be carried. God pictures this as though uh, caring like a mother feeds and caresses her child. You will be dandled on her knees. The ESV says you'll be bounced upon her knees. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. And you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. Don't you love this, this imagery uh, that, that God shows using the, the mother's care for a child down to even the, the gentle caressing of, the nurturing of, the bouncing of this child. Look how practical that is. How down to earth that is. And yet how tender that is. God says, I'm going to care for you. I'm going to take care of you. Again, let's note, he's pointing to the time that we live in right now. God is taking care of us. When you see this, verse 14, your heart shall rejoice. Your bones shall flourish like grass. The hand, in other words, you're going to be really strong. The hand of the Lord shall be known to his servants and his indignation to his enemies. All right, I want to be with God, not against God. For behold, the Lord will come with fire. 
with his chariots like a whirlwind, all right, wrath with fire, swiftness like a whirlwind, to render his anger with fury, his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword, the Lord will judge all flesh. Judgment is not just localized, it's everybody. And the slain of the Lord shall be many. But those who sanctify themselves and purify themselves to go to the gardens after an idol in the midst, eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse unclean, shall be consumed together, says the Lord. All right, here are some folks that are going to go into apostate practices that are described here. They're wandering off into the other gardens, and God says, I know about that. I will consume that. Drop down to 22 as we close out. As the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. It's interesting this came up this morning in Second Peter. I knew it was going to come up tonight in Isaiah I mentioned this morning, if you were in this class, that uh, this phrase is used several times, even in the book of Isaiah, this new heavens and the new earth. And it's a reference to a new dispensation, something new that's coming all together. From Isaiah's time, it pictures the church age. And then Isaiah, or rather Peter, will borrow this language, and John in the Revelation will borrow this language that, that is just throwing forward to an age yet to come. And they will borrow this language to refer to just heaven itself, eternity that is to come. You know, the church is the population of heaven, except for the angels and, and God, right? And so quite often, you know, the church can be referred to in that way. That's why sometimes when you read the New Testament and you read the kingdom, you know, the kingdom of the Lord or the kingdom of heaven, sometimes it's referring to the place where God lives, Sometimes it's referring to us, right? We're the kingdom. And the reason why is because ultimately we're the inhabitants of heaven anyway, the church. And that's kind of what we're, we have going on here. This new dispensation, this new age. And he says, just as sure as this age is to come, so shall your descendants and your name remain. In other words, this thing that's coming, it's going to last. It shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another. We're talking about regular things here, month by month, week by week, borrowing from the familiarity of Judaism. Isaiah speaks of the worship that's to come here. All flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. They shall, look, they shall go forth and look upon the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me. Here's a stark contrast. There's death but then there's life on the part of those who are faithful. For their worm does not die. Their fire is not quenched, referring to those who are unfaithful. They shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. The eternal punishment of the wicked. Even though he ends on that note of justice, uh, Isaiah does so laced with the beauty of hope. That there is sure to come this lasting covenant that ultimately ushers God's people right up to heaven. And that's the time that we live in right now. And aren't you thankful? That's how Isaiah ends it. There's a lot more that could be said. That's about all that we can say in about 12 weeks' time. <laughs> we packed as much in as we could. Let's conclude in prayer. Father, what a blessing that we can study your word together. We're grateful for the ministry and message of Isaiah, your prophet. And we are just thrilled as we read of what he anticipated and what we, in large part, now know. We're so grateful to live in the Christian dispensation. We're so grateful for Jesus. We're so grateful for the message of the gospel. And we pray that we'll be diligent in our own obedience to it. And then in sowing that seed, as far and as wide as possible. Help us, Father, to imitate the example of Isaiah, who persisted in faithfulness and in proclamation of your message, even when others refused to listen. And help us, as Isaiah did, 
to continually set our sights on things eternal, on your precious promises that will become a reality, hope that will be realized. We're so grateful. We pray, Father, that you'll help us to draw closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen.